Hello? Hi. Hi, how are you? Oh, not too bad. I managed to get a certain paper uh, online last night, like, submitted. It, it took me all day. I don't oh. know about it. That was the worst part of writing the whole thing and doing the whole thing, was submitting it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it always is a pain. Like, you have to put all this stuff together for it. And, you know, um, yeah, it's a lot of work. A lot more than it should be. <laughs> well, I, there are so many parts to it. No, I have no funding. How do you say that? Like, okay, well, I have a set phrase. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for no funding. And so you put that in there, and it doesn't work the first time. <laughs> it's yeah. like, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, <laughs> it's submitted. I yeah. hope it's all there. Yeah, that would be great. Um, well, I, I put your name on. Oh, that. yeah? As like reviewer. a reviewer? Okay, I'll look forward to seeing if I get called. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, I don't know why. I can't seem to set up my... Uh, camera i can't get my camera to display here for some reason so let's see we have a couple new people here uh we have uh zura we have abd uh would you two guys like to introduce yourselves yeah sure head on hi uh so i'm zura uh, I'm uh, studying in Georgia, Tbilisi State University, um, and uh, I'm interested in uh, biologically inspired uh, AI. And right now, doing uh, some research related to it. Um, I, I was uh, familiar with Open World before, but it's my first time joining a Devo One meeting. So, hello, on. Well, welcome. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and then uh, ABD. Uh, yeah. Hello everyone. Yeah. Uh, Hi. Yes. Yeah. So my name is Mohammad Abdullah and I'm from National Institute of Technology in from India. I'm a sophomore and I'm interested in computer vision and machine learning. I'm doing study on that with uh, friends of mine in the college. And so I'm very interested in looking forward to like, collaborate in this project, like mainly the upgrading they would run. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, 3.1. Yes. Yeah, 3.1. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Um, thank you. What was that? You were going to say something else? Uh, I have worked with uh, like, uh, machine learning models, like basically Python. I was just uh, recently trying to implement or basically understand the ResNet architecture and working on safety information with that. Okay, that sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. And uh, like I've worked on some uh, project in involving pandas, like uh, it was automated data scraping and analysis with uh, some seniors of mine. Okay. And that's it. And that's all. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you for the introductions. And of course, we have uh, people who've been here before. So. Welcome, Abhishek and Jesse and Karun, Minak, Susan, and Yash as well. Um, and Mayuk, hello Mayuk. Um, so yeah, and Jesse says, uh, plus one for inspired AI, bio-inspired AI. Uh, so yeah, uh, Azura, yeah, we, we do a, a fair amount of stuff with bio-inspired AI. We're interested in that. Uh, we're kind of, you know, kind of. It's a theme in the group, and then there's another group that we have that does uh, more work on the, in this area. So uh, we can talk about that later if you're interested in, in participating in that group as well. Yeah, sure. I would, I would be super interested. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, so welcome to the meeting uh, today. I don't know why my camera is not working. Uh, it's keep sending me a message failed to access your camera although I'm looking at it right now and it the lights on so I don't know why the 
the platform here isn't letting me access my camera, but I might be able to share my screen. If I can share my screen, then it'll be just as good. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank everyone who's who's been uh, uh, communicating with Mayok and myself on uh, GSOC applications, such so Google Summer of Code applications. Uh, a number of you have sent your applications for us to read over, or I've read them over, I don't know about Mayok, but um, and suggested, you know, how to make it, how to improve the, uh, how to improve the uh, application to make it better. And then, of course, we talked about the timeline. Um, I think the timeline is the most important part of the application. So those of you applying really to any kind of grant or, uh, you know, something where you have to propose a project, I think it's always a good idea to really kind of work out your timeline of deliverables and like get that down and for grants it's actually you know doubly important to go and you know uh put together when you're putting together like a budget to do kind of the same thing to think about like every item and how you know if things are uh if you run into problems during your uh time that you're proposing you know what are your alternatives um and so this is especially important with gsoc because We've had this in a number of years where we've run into problems with computing power. We've run into problems with some approach not working. And so you need to be able to improvise and, and you know, do things that won't tie you up or slow you down. So that's, I mean, I was going to put that into the onboarding guide, but I think that's probably okay. Uh, I don't I, I don't know how to put it in there without making it a big, long um, uh uh, demo or, or tutorial. So I'm just going to say that in the meeting and just tell people that. So let's see if I can share my screen here. I think I can, actually. Okay, can everyone see my screen here? Yeah. Okay, good. So first thing I'd like to talk about is Devo Learn. So this is the, this is the uh, GitHub organization that we have. And if you're applying to Project 3.1, you'll be uh, contributing to this uh, repository, DevoLearn, and I see that uh, Rudik, for example, has made a recent pull request here, and a number of you have made pull requests in this repository. So I don't. There's one open right now, but we, you know, that's we always have people making. We've had uh, maybe about 10 to 15 pull requests this season, so that's good. Uh, I don't know if I can get to the pull accepted pull requests or not but that's okay because I just wanted to point out that there have been a lot of contributions to this Devo Learn platform and this is the platform that we're talking about here it's in this repository so this was actually my Oaks GSOC project from last year and he's been maintaining this uh, repository uh, since his project so you know we had something called Hacktoberfest last year, which is a activity that uh, GitHub sponsors to uh, encourage people to contribute to open source platforms. And we had a number of uh, participants wow. during Hacktoberfest making different pull requests. And, you know, in GitHub, if you make, if, you know, people are, are registering uh, different organizations, and if you make five pull requests to uh, any organization, and it can be across the organizations for the five, any organization that participates, you get a free t-shirt. So it's it's a, a nice incentive. But I think um, this is the Devo Learn uh, sort of tutorial here. So if you're interested in Project 3.1, you should go to this uh, repository and, um, you know, look it over, make sure that you're all right, so uh, Mayuk has made a link here. So yeah, he already accepted the pull request. Thank you. Um, so that's, yeah. Or, well, okay. Anyways, the, I don't know where the list of uh, contributors is. I think actually you can see it on the front page here. You have your 14 contributors in this repo. So. Uh, actually, I think it's in the organization, but it's been mostly this repo. And then we also have other things going on in this platform. So this platform was meant to be like something that incorporated the 
software, which is a pre-trained model for uh, microscopy data. Then we have other types of things like the uh, DevoZoo, which is a list of model organisms. This uh, isn't quite ready yet, but it's being flushed out. Um, we also have uh, some other uh, repos like C. elegans DevoLearn, which is the web app to support the C. elegans part of the DevoLearn library. So there, there's a library of models that we use as well. It's associated with the DevoWorm AI uh, web interface that I, I've been telling people about. And so uh, we're trying to put this all together. It's still kind of not quite, um, you know, in a in a place where we have like, you know, I mean, we're trying to promote it, but it's like, it's still a work in progress. And that's true of most open source projects, as you'll find a lot of them are sort of built gradually and they have releases and, you know, just they get worked out. Now, sometimes they do a formal release for an open source project, but this in this case, we're not, you know, we'd like to get things out and, and get things built. So it's, you know, it's, um, we also, you know, we have the inter uh, web interface for a lot of this through the Diva Learn AI, which I've put the link in the Slack for that. Um, and that's a series of, and some people have asked me questions about that in terms of, you know, what kinds of models are you accepting for your model library? And the answer is, you know, it's mostly machine learning models, mostly for microscopy data to segment and analyze microscopy data. But we're also interested in other types of models such as uh, simulations, cellular automata, or other types of models like that. And so we have, uh, we're building other repositories in here to accept some of those uh, models as well. We also have a series of data science demos where people have also contributed to this. So this is actually, okay, this is by repo. So in this repo, we have eight contributors and they've all contributed some sort of uh, tutorial you know, it could be anything like, you know, a Jupyter notebook to show people how to run a GAN or a network analysis, or maybe something like transferring data. There we have one on neural style transfer. These are all just opportunities for people to come and learn different techniques and to use like a sort of in a tutorial format, uh, get to using uh, uh, CoLab notebooks, Jupyter notebooks and the like. So, I just wanted to revisit this uh, organization, see how we were doing. Um, and you're free to make a pull request at any time. If you see an issue that you want to address, please do so. All right, so next up is the, I want to think, oh, well, we have the, uh, this. so this is the onboarding guide I've told people about, and I'll put this link in the chat as well. So this is our onboarding guide. And this is not just for, uh, uh, Google Summer of Code, although it's sort of organized like that right now. But if you're interested in joining uh, Devil Worm and getting involved, this is a good primer to sort of give you some context about where we are. So, you know, we're in the Open Worm Foundation. You're in the Open Worm Slack when you come into the Slack. And we're a, cha a couple of channels in the Open Worm Foundation Slack. But we're also sort of a semi independent group. We have a website. We have a GitHub organization, and we have a YouTube channel. So we have a lot of different things that, you know, you can investigate for, you know, to learn about like OpenWorm and DevoWorm and all these things. OpenWorm uh, has, we had in 2016, we had an OpenWorm open house. And this is for people who want to learn more about OpenWorm as an organization. Um, we have uh, uh playlist from that open house of short talks on each project. So there's DevoWorm, there's C302, there's, um, um, I'm trying to think of some of, there's like movement analysis, there's uh, Geppetto, and you know, there are other projects that were presented during that um, open house. And we have all of those in here. We also have some tutorials on uh, different models that are, you know, our community works with. So we have a model, uh, cellular automata model um, called Morphozoic, and we had a tutorial on that. We had uh, another tutorial, and I can't remember what it was, but 
If you're interested in learning more about OpenWorm, I would go there or to the supplemental materials in Figshare, which is basically all those presentations plus some side references as well. Um, and then, you know, there's an introduction to open source. There's uh, information about the, the GSOC projects. So if you're interested in the GSOC projects, you can learn more here. Um, this is a good f set of first issues. So we still need to work on the good set of first issues, um, good first issues. And it might just be a matter of putting these up in the uh, onboarding guide. I, I wanted to make it so that people could go in, grab a first issue, and then potentially get started. And this would be maybe something beyond just GSOC, but I think, you know, people are always looking for things to do and we don't really know how to guide them directly. So this is a good resource to, to guide them into that place. Um, we also have a little bit of information on model organism biology. So those of you working on project 3.1, these are some basic resources for learning about C. elegans uh, from this idea, you know, idea about unlocking the secrets of the brain. So, you know, a, a big overview of why C. elegans is important to some, you know, examples of micrographs of the brain, and then some links to some basic references on biology and microscopy. So if you want to know something about like how many cells a C. elegans has, or, you know, where it is in the tree of life, or, you know, different types of microscopy that you might use to look at C. elegans, that's all at that link. We also have some references on diatoms. So if you're interested in, in Project 3.2, this is a good place to go for that. You have, uh, you know, diatoms are these really interesting organisms. Um, they're, they're very ubiquitous around the world. Like, much like C. elegans, actually, but they're a very different type of organism. So I would look at these references if, if you want to get some background for your proposals. And then finally, if you're applying to 3.3, there is this information about axolotls. So I have an introduction to axolotls and an introduction to axolotl development. And I don't know if, if Susan or someone else who is biologically oriented wants to add to this in terms of tutorials, you can send me information or, you know, links and I can put them in here because I don't know, you know, ideally I'd like to be able to have a couple more model organisms in here. Uh, it's not of immediate need, but we, you know, if we want to sort of get people involved in some of these other types of projects, that would be nice. And then finally, we have biological data sets. Some of you asked me about biological data sets, uh, DevoZoo, which has a lot of different uh, data sets, not only from C. elegans and uh, diatoms, but from axolotls. And actually, I don't think we have, well, we have the axolotl data set, but I don't usually make it public. Um, then we have like zebrafish and uh, drosophila and even spiders. So there are a lot of different model organisms to work with potentially. Um, then there's this movement database, which is not run by us, but by another group in OpenWorm, and, and if you want to play with those data, that's there's a link to that. We've In past years, people have worked with this, this data to do interesting things. Uh, and then there's types of biological analysis, so you can read that over. Those are like, once you get the data, then what can we do with it? What are, why is it interesting to, to build a machine learning model to extract uh, data points? Because that's what the, some of the GSOC projects are, and I want to make sure, actually, I want to add to that a little bit more, but to make it salient to people why you want to uh, do this. So I would like to, um, okay, so we have any questions about that or, uh, oh, this was the closed uh, PRs on DevoLearn. So I think that's, yeah, okay. So this will take us to the contributors. Thank you, Mayuk. I didn't see that before. So we have Riddick. We have Minoc, we have Shruti, we have uh, Tharun, we have uh, Abtaha, we have um, Ravi, Jainal. So we have a lot of different people contributing to this. Jesse Parent, um, a lot of different people contributing different types of, and you know, it doesn't have to be a huge commit. 
it can just be a very small commit and you can go ahead and uh, make the commit and it's usually Mayoku's, Mayoku's um, uh, accepting the pull requests. Be patient, you, you know, you might have to wait a day or two, but we'll get to you and accept the pull request. If, if there's something wrong with your, you know, if there's some stylistic problem or some alignment problem, you know, then we'll, we'll let you know. We're, uh, Mayo has been very good at like spotting errors in the pull request. So thank you, Mayo, for that. And we have, you know, it's, it's, I think we're doing pretty well in terms of keeping the uh, quality of code up because that's been a problem in a lot of open source projects is uh, accepting substandard code. Um, and I have an article on that. I don't have it with me, but um, the, well, be, let it be known that, that that can be a problem. And so you want to be careful about that. Um, so good. Um, any questions at this point? Um, I want to thank Jesse Parent for going through the uh, the issues board and, and sorting it out. We haven't like talked about our issues board in a while, but we have an issues board for the larger DevilLearn group. So DevilLearn is like a small subset of what we do here. We do a lot of other things. We do things with submitting projects. We do a lot of stuff on sort of the boundary of computational biology and biology and, you know, uh, AI and data science and uh, machine learning. So we're doing, a, we have our fingers in a lot of pies. And so it's critical that we have these boards for uh, reviewing uh, topics and items. So we have all these GitHub issues and some of them are, a lot of them aren't related in this board to specific code uh, issues. So like in the DevilLearn board, you'll find issues that relate to some code issue something in the in the code base. In the DevilWorm discrete meetings board, these are issues that are more general, that are like things that we need to do, uh, concepts even, and then we'll split those into different uh, issues later on. So we have a number of things that are in progress, finished action items. So we have these, actually this action item is finished. Um, but we have a lot of things that are sort of outstanding uh, we have a lot of papers like this morphogenesis and deep learning paper that I talked about last week. Uh, open, open worm abstract for international C. elegans meeting. That's actually uh, been submitted, but it's we're waiting to hear back for, for, for it. Um, some of these things are like find a place to submit different abstracts. Uh, make network science submission is finished. Um, this Bacillary non neuronal cognition paper, this is something that we'll be turning to in the next couple weeks. The get data for Susan's spherical image, Axolotl, that's I think finished uh, because I think we did get, well, I don't know. I think Susan was gonna give me a second round of those, uh, but I don't know if we wanna keep that open. Um, I'm going to hopefully get some more images using my Ball microscope. Okay. Well, let me make a note here. So we like to make notes on these. Uh, if I can, actually, you have to click on it like this, I think, and then I can make a note. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, so this is. Uh, there we go. Uh, that that's something that like that'll make it clear that that's not like just getting the data that we already have. So so yeah, I look forward to seeing that. Uh, this work on ANNs, BNNs, extended abstract. I think that's finished. Or we we submitted this to the A Life conference, and I don't know what if it's been accepted or not, but. We will probably work on like editing, you know, uh, making it better, making, you know, there will be opportunities to improve upon it. So I want to, I want to say it's finished, but it, it will probably come back on our radar. Um, uh, Christian and myself, we were working on these conference presentations. I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
update people, oh, updating the Devaworm ML lectures. So last year, of course, we did this Devaworm ML series, and I still want to update these, and I, I kind of was doing this at the end of last year, and then I stopped. Uh, and I want to get back into it, but I've been very busy. So this is something that we'll be doing. Um, I don't know if there's a link to the Devaworm ML uh, repository here, but if you actually go to the main website, you'll see Devorm ML, and you can click on that, and that's basically a syllabus of this course. Um, and we've updated like two or three so far, so it's it's you know it's it's going along. So, um, axolotl embryo animations and segmentation. That was something that I was kind of hoping that we could get uh, through. Uh, this, you know, in this GSOC period, but I haven't, I don't know if we've done much with that, but we'll, we'll make that like, you will know, put that on hold for now and then see if we get some applicants for that. Um, how do we do this? Updates on da axolotl data and analysis in the action items column. Uh, recruit people as devil learning contributors. We're kind of doing that through GSOC. Um, so that's, you know, probably in progress, uh, this Devo Worm bibliography. So I, I've had some, uh, I think Jesse and Dick were talking about, uh, doing this and maintaining it. So I, I don't know if we have any updates on that, but I'm going to assume that we're still working on that. Um, anyways, we're trying to make a bibliography out of are different. So you'll see later in the meeting, we review papers every week. And we also have papers we publish, and they're good papers that come out all the time that, you know, it's hard to keep track of all of them. So we want to put together a bibliography, and maybe even not just like an EndNote bibliography or a Zotero bibliography, but like a, an annotated bibliography where we have like a citation, a paper, and then we describe something about it underneath. And we can actually then use it to kind of, you know, have our own internal database for sorting those references. But I don't know if I should put that in, maybe in progress. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, we're also, you know, if you have anything that you want to make a YouTube tutorial for, like I showed that there were, we have tutorials for uh, data science, uh, like, you know, uh, digital notebooks for data science. But if you want to make a YouTube tutorial, maybe on a paper or on some other technique that you think is important to go over on YouTube, like, you know, record yourself talking about a paper or about, uh, you know, prepare some uh, PowerPoint slides and go through them and describe something for a wider audience, we can put it up on our YouTube channel and we can, uh, you know, that would be something that would be perhaps get a lot of views. Um, and be a, an important reference for some people. So yeah, that's something to think about. Um, this pre evil learn paper from Joss submission, that's sort of, uh, I'm going to put this as an action item because I keep glossing over it <laughs> every time I get some free time. And I, I want to get to this, but I haven't been able. We submitted a paper to the Journal of Open Source Science on evil learn, but they didn't think it was an important enough reference right now. So a resource. So I think, you know, we're going to create a, a bigger paper that would end up being like something like a, a preprint or a technical paper and then maybe publish it somewhere in the future. So we're working on that, though, right now. Um, and then we're also always looking for this. Uh, people want to do visualizations in developmental biology. So we have creating an embryo model in Blender and the embryo visualization. So one output for this, one, one venue for this, is the OpenWorm Docker. Uh, the OpenWorm Foundation is creating a Docker file with all of the major projects in it. And they want to have something you can execute, an executable file that you can execute and show sort of a demonstration of the area that you're working in. So for DivaWorm, that would be like some sort of uh, model of an embryo, I would imagine. And so we're looking, you know, I think Ujwal was working on this for a while and then he dropped it and I don't know where we are with that but I would like to maybe continue with that in some capacity. If people are interested in contributing, let me know. Um, I think this is pretty much 
off the radar. And this is axolotl montaging. This is contingent upon the uh, pro the GSOC project. So I think that's a good review of our major tasks. Thank you once again to Jesse for making more sense of that than it was last week. Um, it looks a lot cleaner now, uh, and you're going through some of those issues. Um, but well, I want to. I haven't gone through that board in a while, so I wanted to kind of give an update on that. We have a, someone in the chat here. Okay, Myuk says. Or is I'm working on improving Devil at around mid-April, right around the time when the GSOC student application period ends. Everyone is welcome to help me in improving Devil Learn, regardless of GSOC. So yes, thank you, Mayuk, for that statement. Um, if you want to contribute to, do you, can you contribute to anything in our group without being accepted to GSOC? The answer is yes. Um, if you feel that that's something that will help you in your uh, studies or your career, that would be fine. We're, we're we're absolutely willing to work with you, um, but right now we're doing the GSOC student applications, so the application period starts today, and it goes through mid-April, um, and so that's a good um, but a good opportunity for people to get some uh, experience in coding in that. So Jesse would like to speak. Yeah, I'm actually using the hand function for once, so I'm proud of myself for that. One thing, because I'm looking at my notes from last week and looking at the board, and I don't know if this one was on the board or not, uh, so I might have missed it, um, a little connection error. But um, there were a few things from that I, I took notes on for stuff to do. Uh, one of them was the boring billion stuff. Is that in there somewhere? Oh, maybe not. It might not be updated, but um, yeah, we should add something on that. I know we have it in the in the spreadsheet for submissions. Yeah. Um, is that what is that? Is that, is that like a? Are we making a? As it, I think I seen that's like a paper or an abstract, right? It's a yeah. It's so it's it wasn't going to be a paper, and we didn't submit it to the venue we thought we were going to do. So it's basically this this uh, paper. This, I don't know if it might might even be a book at some point where we're looking at this period of evolution called the boring billion. It's between the time you have like the establishment of life and like, you know, complex multicellular life. So you get like a long period where there's very little going on in evolution. Then all of a sudden you get like five or six kingdoms that arise at once or, you know, within about half a million years. And so this is like, why would that happen? Uh, there, uh, key oxygenation events that sort of prime the pump for this explosion of diversity in life. But like this period where there's nothing going on, we don't really know beyond maybe like some, you know, ecological factors, why that would be. I mean, you know, it, so, you know, it's, it's a pretty open area because there isn't a lot of good data. You know, it's like we have a lot of, we're doing a lot of looking at uh, the paleontological data we're looking at, you know, we're considering, diff we're, we're creating visualizations. I think I showed the visualization in the meeting of, you know, maybe like putting together a phylogeny to show, you know, where these things are with respect to the tree of life. So you can maybe make inferences about what maybe was responsible. There is, there's a lot going on there. And it's not like strictly developmental and it's not strictly C. elegans. But it is, a, you know, it's an interesting topic, I think, to kind of get involved, you know, start to, you know, get people thinking about maybe like evolution or, you know, uh, simulating long time periods. Yeah, I'm really interested in both of those things in general. And obviously, I have my own like frontier map perspective, which this kind of fits into. Uh, so I wanted to mention that. I made a, I'll make it, I made an issue um, that now. And the other one on my list. Um, there were a few that came last time, uh, but one was, one was, uh, Euler pasture developments for oil pasture development. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was computational toolboxes for math of the one. Yeah. Or like, math and models of the one. Yeah. Well, I, I wasn't, I didn't, I put them as notes, but I didn't quite know what those two things were or if it's the same thing. Yeah, so the Euler paths for life, could you put these two on the board, please. Yeah. Yeah. 
So Euler Paths for Life is, I'll talk about in the submissions. It was a, it's a paper that uh, we're working on. I'm mainly working on it. It's like a network approach to looking at like organization of multicellularity. So um, using a mathematical tool called Euler Paths to determine like if a colony, you know, a colony of cells is coherent or modular or something like that. And then, uh, and I gave a presentation on that earlier this, or I think last year to the group. And I'm trying to get that back up and running, but it's, you know, uh, it's something that probably requires uh, maybe some more thought. I, I was going to submit a paper to one of the network conferences this year, but I don't know if that's doable. Um, and then the mathematics of Diva Worm is something that someone in the open worm group has solicited. Um, it's, it's basically, and I have it here, actually. Let me go to the, I have it open. So this is the mathematics of Diva Worm, and this is just kind of a first pass approximation at this. Basically, like spelling out all of the data structures and key equations that you might want to have in your back pocket if you're talking about development and um, you know so we have for our embryo analysis we have this data structure which is a five tuple in this example where you have cell position in the embryo you have the time that the cell is born uh, then you have this angle of movement or angle of division where when the cell is born and, and uh, it moves away from its origin point from the where the parent was in the embryo and moves to a new position and they move around a lot anyway so you can characterize that with an angle a phase angle and so that's one you know equation then you have this von Neumann neighborhood which can characterize cells behaving in parallel they're doing a lot of signaling and of course we can model morphogenesis using a cellular automata so we have these these uh, that this is the basic unit or kernel of that type of uh, cellular arrangement, the von Neumann neighborhood. And this is just the radius of the neighborhood here. And then you know we have these data structures for looking at developmental function, like node attachment and complex networks. So when a complex network starts to add nodes, which you would have with if you had like a developmental system where cells were being born and being associated with one another you'd have node attachment and then form a complex network you also have neural networks so you have like you know uh, neurons communicating with neurons or you have a neural network where it's abstracted to nodes and connections weighted connections and then you have lineage trees which describe the line of descent for different cells as mother cells give birth to daughter cells and the like so there are a couple more things I'd like to add to this, but I think, you know, it's it's basically, you know, what are the basic equations you need to have or the basic data structures that characterize development? Um, and I have these categories here, but this is going to end up being like, um, you know, I'm going to make this a little bit better in terms of the organization. This is like a poster, and then we're going to maybe write a paper around it or an oh. article. Yeah. Yeah, because I wasn't sure what well, like is the result going to be a like a deliverable of a paper or like a set of educational materials or yeah, I was curious about that part of it too. Yeah, we were thinking of like targeting with uh, a thing called Worm Worm Book, which is a reference for people doing C. elegans research, but it's mostly biological. Um, they're they're not really that up on computation. So, I mean, it might actually be like its own standalone educational reference, too. Um, but I don't know yet. So, that's good. Um, thank you for updating that. Um, so, the yeah, next. Oh. That was all that I had for my, my notes. So okay. Thank you. thank you. I'd like to ask is anyone, uh, does anyone want to give a, a short demo on something they've been doing this week? I know we've had people doing this. Um, they've been doing stuff for their uh, proposals and they've been working on. I know Minoc wanted to do one, but he didn't have time to do it this week. So we'll do that, uh, Minoc's next week. But I just want to make sure I didn't skip over anyone who wanted to.
Okay. Um, okay, so I think we'll go into the submissions spreadsheet. And this, again, you, if you've been attending the meetings, you've seen this a lot. This is where we have our things that we want to remind people that things are due, they're coming due. Um, there's this evolution conference uh, at the end of April that is, we have a couple of potential things that Euler Paths for Life it might be an abstract there, but it's not uh, really for that audience. I'm trying to make it maybe relevant to that audience, but I want to make sure that, you know, wherever it gets submitted, it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. So, uh, and then uh, Krishna had a, a another submission he wanted to make, but I haven't heard an update on this recently. So we'll keep thinking about this and working on it. And hopefully we can make this deadline. Uh, there's this Evil Learn paper, which I mentioned before. It doesn't really have a deadline. It's just a preprint right now. We have this growth form and theory of deep learning. This is a paper where we consider deep learning as maybe a way for to, to maybe describe developmental biology or contribute to development, developmental biology beyond just kind of like, uh, you know, segmenting images. So this is like, a you know, more of a theoretical paper on, you know, if you take a deep network, what does it have in common with uh, developmental biology? And so, you know, that's a that's a very speculative piece in a lot of ways. But it's uh, if you want to know more, there's this. Uh, file on the drive, and we've worked out about maybe two pages of a, an extended abstract at this point. So let me put that in the chat. Okay. Okay, so Vrudik said, uh, I am still working on something and improving it. I'll go for it later. So that's very good. Um, let's go back to the submission. So that's for this. Uh, some people, you know, there might be people who are interested in contributing to that who haven't seen this before. So... Um, there's this bacillary and non-neuronal cognition paper. So this is a paper we're going to be putting into the Mathematics of Diatoms uh, book. And this is due April 30th. I, I, we've already submitted a uh, proposal for this, so it's been accepted there. We just need to finish off the paper. Um, and it's just a matter of m me and other people sitting there and going over it. <laughs> Um, it's, you know, not a, it's not a lot of work, but it's, you know, you have to get over that hump. So, uh, poor Ed Gleason, who's, uh, runs the C302 project, he, uh, emailed me and some other people in Open Room, like, about a week and a half ago, about submitting an, a poster to, oh, to the International Sea Elegans Conference. Oh, hello, Krishna. Okay, um, and so that was done. We we have a now we have like a, a open worm poster submission. I think it might be even a talk. We don't know yet what track it's going to be accepted into. But this is the conference that uh, all the big C. Elegans people go to, um, and it's like every two years. And um, so you know it's nice to get exposure there to the larger C. Elegans community. It's a lot of people who work on the biology of C. Elegans, like. You know, they use C. elegans in all sorts of different biological systems. It's a model organism for, you know, starvation, for aging, for um, different, you know, uh, motor dis motor neuron diseases. They have analogs in C. elegans. They do a lot of genetics. So it's a, so it's a nice conference, and, and hopefully, you know, they're... Could you mute, please, whoever that is? Thank you. Um, so that would, you know, that's going to be, you know, hopefully people see it and are impressed, as they always are, um, with a lot of the work that Open Worm's doing. Um, so let's see, this is this paper, which didn't happen. This embryo networks and connectomes. This is something that was submitted in Networks 2021, but um, you know it's something that is sort of ongoing. It's it's in the form of a, an abstract, and this is actually something that uh, you know we have some net. We have a lot of network science work in the Devon group. We 
It goes back to our network embryos paper, which was published in Biosystems. We had another uh, paper on uh, developmental connectomes, which was also published in Biosystems. Uh, last year, uh, I wrote a paper on uh, developmental connectomes that was in the Frontiers, um, one of the Frontiers journals. And so the next step in this, I think, is to look at net, like look at developmental connectomes or developmental networks in embryos and C. elegans is where we have a lot of the data for this. And so this this submission is actually um, how to take these connectomes and integrate, or how to take these networks and integrate them. So uh, this talks about um, extracting networks from different subsystems within the developing organism. And in this case, it's C. elegans. So you have this network that's like the embryo network, which is just a bunch of cells that are, um, you know, you have an embryo that's where the cells are dividing and moving around, but they're forming these proximity networks. So, you know, you can uh, use a different distance threshold and determine what cells are closer or farther away from one another. And so they, they, they form these networks that are, you know, basically analogous to some sort of like, you know, if you think about like cell to cell signaling, uh, what is the sort of the efficacy of any, you know, signal that gets sent out by one cell, what other cells are within its proximity. And so those networks can describe that structure across the organism. Uh, but you also have connectomes that are emerging. And so connectomes, you know, cells are differentiating into um, neurons and they're also making, forming networks. And so the idea of this paper would be, how do we, A, how do we characterize the growth of these networks? And B, how do we integrate these networks? So it's, a def it's just at an abstract stage right now, but there's much more work to do on this. And finally, there's uh, The Boring Billion, which is on this. That's this potential book contribution. And I, I don't want to put Wave Special Issue here. I want to say we don't know where it's going. And then the details are that it's, um, that there's like, Simulating long time periods in evolution very thinking. I just wanted to put those in because I think those are the themes that are like important for this work. Uh, maybe you know we can explore those themes more outside of this submission, but I just wanted to give people a heads up on that. Um, there's also this Kindle book, which is an interesting idea posed by Krishna, who's here, and uh, it basically compiling a lot of the stuff that we've done into a Kindle book. Uh, I don't know if, you know, that's still something that's on hold, but if other people are interested in contributing to that, it's something you can do. Um, we have this DevoLearn presentation at INCF Neuroinformatics Assembly, which is coming up in April. Um, you can register for it now. It's If you go to the INCF main page, incf.org, They'll probably have a link to the symposium somewhere. And this is an assembly where people present on different projects. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to try to present on DevoLearn and give like a, a, you know, some information about, uh, you know, to a broader audience about what DevoLearn is trying to accomplish. Maybe some of the things we're doing in this group, a little bit beyond like the scope of the platform, but, um, this is the actual abstract for this. So this abstract uh, goes through some of our educational efforts in the group, and those served as the precursor of the Steve Learn platform. Then we talk about Devo Worm AI, Devo Zoo. Those are all components. The pre trained model is a component. Um, and then I actually want to talk about something in this that we don't talk about in this group so much which is the idea of an epistemological directory, which is this thing that we work on in our other group um, and, and, and kind of talking about how you might build one for this topical area. And so it's an informatics tool that engages newcomers with different topics and, and field specific concepts. And it's very important when you get into a new field to, to sort of get oriented. And that's what these directories do. And so 
um, I want to maybe talk a little bit about that as well. And then also talk about maintaining and sustaining this platform and how that might be achieved. Uh, just These are just ways, I think these are topics that INCF is particularly interested in. So, uh, But I think that that's going to make for a nice presentation. Hopefully we get some, um, you know, we get some uh, press, I guess is the word I'm looking for, on for this project. So there's a, it's a, a big community. It's a lot of community interested in like the neuroinformatics of uh, neuroscience. So people who do like data structures and people who do like, you know, data science and, and other types of uh, interesting projects surrounding uh, building resources, you know, open source resources. So it's a really, I think it's a really relevant group to present to. Um, then we also have this ANN's BNN's abstract that was submitted to AYF. We haven't heard back about that. If you're interested in submitting to Neuro IPS, which is very, very competitive, I will say, but if you're interested in submitting something, a paper, the deadline is May 19th and the full paper is May 26th. The May 19th deadline is for abstracts. So if you're, uh, again, I wouldn't hold my breath if you submit a paper that's going to get accepted, but I, you know, if there's something that people want to submit there, um, definitely that's the deadline. And then they have a host of uh, workshops that are uh, very good, but also have later deadlines. So if we find one of those workshops and people find it interesting, please let me know and I can put it on the list. This is this Mathematics of Diva Worm book is the next one. That's uh, Michael and the Worm book. And but it's right now it's a poster. And so if you have ideas for that, please let me know. Uh, finally, we have a couple of things. The Society for Developmental Biology Conference is happening uh, this summer. So the submissions for that are April 19th. The submissions are a bit, you know, it, it like costs like, I think $50 to submit an abstract. I'm not crazy about that, but this is the information for the meeting in this link. If you want to know more about the meeting, and then there's this Living Machines Conference, which is uh, something that if you're interested in develop or if you're interested in bio-inspired AI, is maybe a potential we could place to submit an abstract or just attend. And that this is uh, happening sometime this summer. I don't think the website is up yet for this year, but it's uh, something based out of Europe. But they do cover a lot of things on like living machines and bio-inspired AI and things like that. So that's that's our update on that. Um, finally, I wanted to go, well, actually I wanted to talk about this before I get into our papers. And this is sort of related to our papers. This is a new distilled paper on neurocellular automata. So we've talked about neurocellular automata in the past. We've done these, uh, you know, I think we talked about the paper where they were looking, they were building like they were modeling morphogenesis, they were building shapes in cellular automata. This is another paper from, the, I think, the same group of people. Um, and they're from Google, and then Michael Levin from Tufts is somehow on this too. I don't know how he sleeps, because he's on a, like a lot of papers. I mean, But uh, this is a simulation of self-organized textures. And so you can see in the distill article, they have this simulation at the top. And you can run it over, you know, different speeds. I would run it fast so you can see the effect here. Let's start over from the beginning. So you can see that it forms these textures from sort of a gray, yeah, so sort of like from a noisy background. And it forms these textures. And so it's using this tool called a neural cellular automata. And I can do it for a bunch of textures. So what is a neural cellular automata? Well, this article tells you what that is. It's actually, this article is part of a, the differentiable self-organizing systems thread. So if you're interested in this sort of thing, there's this thread uh, of papers or articles that you can look at. And these are different papers on this. You know, they're trying to find topics, I think. So if you're interested, you should check that out. You should also try these in a Colab notebook. So they actually have a link to the Colab notebook that has all of this in it. So if you want to know what the code looks like underneath, you can go into that. 
Um, so the so neural cellular automata are these basically these neural networks that feed into a cellular automata. So they review patterns, textures, and physical processes. So they talk about zebra stripe formation, which is uh, something that you know is has been mysterious to developmental biology and biology for many years. People wonder how those stripes form. They form in development, but how do they actually form? Is there some process? And people have identified different models for this. So one of the models, of course, is the reaction diffusion model of morphogenesis. And so that's been a standard for probably at least 50 years. Um, but what they're doing here is they're actually able to create uh, patterns using these cellular automata neural network hybrids. And so they talk about uh, partial differential equations. They talk about the chemical basis of morphogenesis, which is this paper that has this reaction diffusion model or proposes a reaction diffusion model of morphogenesis. Um, they also talk about the Grace Scott reaction diffusion model um, and this interactive atlas, which kind of goes over that model. So that those type of approaches have been around for quite a while. But what they're doing here is they're describing their state space with a diff partial differential equation. Then they're moving to uh, cellular automata. So they kind of go through this a little bit and they show a lot of the math. They show how these computational models can be pattern generators. So they show a, a convnet here and they do this, uh, they have this neural part and then they show how they actually can um, get this result. So they use a lot of, they use a, a lot of sophisticated neural network processing and then they use a cellular automata to update the model and then they get this pattern. So they're able to generate the pattern using this type of approach. So if you want to read more, I would look at this paper a bit more and maybe look at this topic of uh, differentiable self-organizing systems. So if you go to that link actually, let's see what they have there. They have self-classifying MNIST digits, self well, we have self-organizing textures. This paper, Growing Neurocellular Automata, this was the original paper we uh, visited about a year, maybe, yeah, about a year ago now, where we talked about this type of model. Um, but they didn't give as much detail in that paper as they do in this paper. So I know that Shruti, who's not here today, is interested in cellular automata. So if you're interested in that topic, um, you know that's a place to go. Uh, let me put this in the link in the chat here, so we can. If people are interested; they can go look at it. Susan says the reaction diffusion model might be a mechanical reaction diffusion system. That's true, and there are other ways to approach this. I know they're generating a lot of patterns with this. But there, you know, there's a lot of life left in the reaction diffusion models that we have, um, that are the classic models. And so, and we've also, you know, done a lot of good pattern formation simulation with just straight up cellular automata models. So you don't necessarily need a neural network to put on top of it. You can do this with like a regular CA. And the question is, is this the CA sufficient or do we need more? You know, or can we just use like a, a reaction diffusion model? But I think the point here is they're trying to solve the PDEs that form this reaction diffusion model with the neural network, and that's the kind of the gold there in the in the uh, in the model. And so I'm going to talk about some papers now. So if you have to leave at the top of the hour, you can leave if you want. But I'm going to uh, go over a couple more. I'm going to go over a couple papers before we end our meeting. Um, I think I will talk about some of these. So, uh, I might mention. I was going to mention the embodied intelligence workshop. But I can do that after the papers too. Oh no, go like, ahead. You can do that now, actually. Yeah. Um. Just. Just. Uh. I might quickly share my screen with it. Okay. Let me unshare then. Um. Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead. Just, uh, 
my Mercury. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, just because I, I actually saw this one. I, this is a big event last week, and kind of for the other group that I'm in, um, we were a lot of us were there. But I wanted to mention it quickly also because uh, it was mentioned of Biofire AI, and also the, the Living Machines Conference that's on the submission, the submit thing here. Uh, this, I actually heard about this through um, this conference. So, uh, through this event. And, uh, oops. So, it's a really, I, I, I'm kind of writing up a little article or report on it. Uh, I, I've taken a bunch of notes on it, and uh, Bradley and another uh, member from our group, Stefan, presented at it, and uh, Danielle was also at it. So, there are, there's sort of a lot of like direct or adjacent people involved with this. And um, it's, where is it explaining what it is? Um, basically, it's 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 a, it's a quite a multidisciplinary look at at embodied intelligence. There's stuff from bio, there's stuff from software bio, there's stuff from philosophy, uh, there's stuff from um, cognitive science, uh, systems neuroscience, Kristen Shepard, Josh Bungard, um, a lot of a lot of a lot of surprisingly big names uh, were at this event. Uh, Brock Golden, um, and then many many people. Um, uh, that, and so I would just say check this out if you're interested in mentioning it in, in the Slack. And there's also uh, what's really cool is the videos are, are 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 available now on YouTube. So so you can pretty much go back and look at things and the discussions on a lot of them. Um, like this, there's a lot of good stuff here. Um, I presented at, at some at things for my own Cognition Futures project in Frontier Maps, and Bradley presented some stuff about developmental AI. Um, and, and so there's a lot of good things here, and uh, there's also a little like uh, like a podcast series that, that they're running adjacent to it. Like it's it's in collaboration with the the soft robotics uh, podcast. And, like an issue, so you can hear some of the things here. I guess I guess press people going on that too, which is cool. Uh, but just putting this out there as like this is a really cool event that that went under the radar because it's I don't think they really happen. I, I look at the history a little bit. They don't really happen regularly necessarily, like every couple of years maybe. Um, and they change the title, so it's not like a consistent thing. But uh, I think it's kind of spearheaded through through Cambridge and some some other places in Europe, kind of the the spirit for it. But uh, definitely worth checking out. Um, you can see some of the people here. Um, and if you're interested in that, mention it in Slack, and uh, we can talk about that. But I really recommend looking at this from from a, a quite a diverse group of perspectives looking at um, embodied intelligence and, and people looking to kind of you know engage in frontiers in that topic. So that's my plug for that. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we had a so we don't talk about embodiment too much in this group, but it's very relevant to development. Uh, we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 developing systems, a developing embryo, which is going to become a body, and then you have a developing brain within that, which is also going to be interacting with the body to produce behavior. And so we don't talk about all those parts all the time, but I think that's an important, you know, those are important things to think about in development. It's an area that's not really been that well explored. There are some really cool papers. I don't think I'll get to those this week. But um, definitely it's something we should talk about more in the group. Um, thank you for that, Jesse. Um, and if you want to know more, you can, uh, we can raise some issue in our Slack about it. it you know, it's up to people what they want to talk about. But uh, so I want to talk about some papers. So actually, the, I'm going to talk about this folder first, I decided. So uh, in, in talking about this uh, Boring Billion uh, work, one of the uh, ideas is that, you know, we might be interested, one of the things we can learn from this work is like simulating long time periods in, in evolution. So this means going back uh, probably over, you know, up to a billion or more years ago. The boring billion was, you know, several billion years ago or several, you know, it was the boring billion ended around a billion years ago. So there's a billion years of diversification of life after that. And so, you know, what can we learn about development during this billion year period that we have uh, is is life diversified 
we needed to have organisms that had a developmental period. So what 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 can we learn about that period? And what does it tell us about development? So I have a couple of papers that are really interesting I found. And this is a theme we can continue on, but this, this is just something that I found, a couple of things that I found. So one of the uh, papers is this paper on, um, uh, all right, let me go down to the actual title here. I don't think that's, there's a title page though in this one. Okay. Um, an over up torrid preserved atop an embryo bearing egg clutch sheds light on the reproductive biology of non-avian uh, theropod dinosaurs. And so what that means is that they're basically, they found a bunch of embryo or embryos in the form of eggs uh, from dinosaurs. And so, so recent studies demonstrated that many avian features evolved incrementally prior to the origin of the group, which is basically birds. But the presence of some of these features, such as bird-like brooding behaviors, remain contentious. In non avalin dinosaur, I don't know what avalin means, but um, it's um, they they like to classify life in different ways, and especially in paleontology, they'll use different language for it. So um, here we report the first non avalin dinosaur fossil known to preserve an adult skeleton atop an egg clutch that contains embryonic remains. That preserved positional relationship of the adult to the clutch coupled with the advanced growth and stages of the embryo and their high estimated incubation temperatures provide strong support for the brooding hypothesis, which is a hypothesis for um, maybe how they raise their young. I'm not really familiar with this literature, so I'm kind of feeling through it here. Uh, furthermore, embryos in the clutch are at different developmental stages, suggesting the presence of asynchronous hatching, a derived feature even among the crown, uh, crown group birds. These findings demonstrate that the evolution of reproductive biology along birdline archosaurs was a complex rather than linear and incremental process and suggests that some aspects of non and theropod reproduction were unique to these dinosaurs. So this is, I mean, this, let me see. So there's a lot of, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of really interesting paleontology going on in China. They have some nice assemblages there of different things, of flowering plants, and of, di of, of this dinosaur era uh, specimens. And so, uh, I don't know if there are any pictures in here that we can see. I think that would be most informative. But, okay, so here's some pictures here. Here's a dinosaur, I think, sitting, laying, sitting on some eggs. I think these are the eggs. I'm not really sure. Let's see what the legend says. Uh, they don't have a legend right available here. But this is the, okay, so this is the dinosaur sitting on the eggs here. These are the dinosaur eggs underneath. And of course, the elegans, you know, has eggs and the eggs hatch, but the uh, the parents don't sit on top of the eggs. They kind of leave them in the, deposit them in different places and go about their business. In this case, you have an organism where they need to sit on their eggs to make them warm enough so that they'll hatch. And so this is sort of, you know, we know that birds do this, of course, modern birds, um, but it's sort of a, you know, a different way of doing this than C. elegans or humans who go live births. And so this is another, um, I don't know what that is. This is a tree of life. This is a phylogeny showing the relationships between these different uh, dinosaur groups and the bird groups. And so this is another case where they're showing some of the remains here. And so this is a an interesting paper. You know, you might not un, you might not understand a lot of it, but it's it seems like it's a pretty interesting paper for learning about like what you know you can find a fossil of an egg and a fossil of an embryo and what those look like. The second paper is developmental processes in Ediacara macrofossils. So the Ediacara biota preserves the oldest fossil evidence of abundant complex metazoans, which are basically animals. It's a group that incorporates any animal cell, any organism with an animal cell. So that's what metazoan is. Uh, despite their significance, assigning individual taxa to specific phylogenetic groups has proved problematic. 
To better understand these forms, we identify developmentally controlled characters or traits and representative taxa or, or species or groups of, or biological groups from the White Sea assemblage and compare them with the regulatory tools drawing similar traits in modern organisms. So they compare fossils with modern organisms and they make this comparison. This analysis demonstrates that the genetic pathways for multicellularity, axial polarity, musculature, and a nervous system were likely present in some of these early animals. So what they do is they take like modern organisms and they look at the regulatory mechanisms that control some of these things. So like, you know, axial polarity is where the cells form a head and a tail very early on, where the musculature is where the muscles form. The nervous system, of course, is where you get neurons and they're, you know, how they connect. And you can actually sample those cells and look at their molecular pathways. And we know enough probably about like, thing, how things are regulated at the genetic level to say maybe something about how they worked in the fossil uh, example. So equally meaningful is the absence of evidence for major differentiation of macroscopic body units, including distinct organs, localized sensory machinery, or appendages, meaning that there's this lack of evidence that there's this, that there are these modules within the organisms in this, in this, uh, so this is 570 to 539 million years ago. And so this was a long time ago this was, I think, probably before the uh, Cambrian, which is where you get a lot of the modern body plans. And, uh, you know, it's, that's not, so, well, it's important to know because basically this is before you get a lot of the modern uh, diversification of phenotypes. So like, you know, a lot of the different organisms like, you know, mammals and birds, and that didn't really exist then. We just had like, you know, simpler organisms that had smaller, you know, smaller numbers of cells and, you know, uh, maybe very rudimentary nervous systems, but probably not. Um, and so that's uh, an apparent lack of heads with concentrated sensory machinery or ventral nerve cords and such taxa supports the hypothesis that these evolved independently in disparate clades or groups of organisms. So they didn't have heads in concentrated sensory machinery back in the Ediacara. This is some, you know, something that evolved maybe in the uh, in the Cambrian period when these organisms were diversifying into different groups, and so this is interesting because, you know, it kind of gives us an idea not only of development but also an ev of evolution and how these things kind of emerged um, and when they emerged. And this, so this is a, you know, this is a, kind of a different approach. They're using fossils. And then they're taking modern organisms and they're kind of making a comparison between the different things that they're finding in this assemblage and modern organisms or modern sort of analogs that they can use to understand what's going on in these organisms. They just leave an impression. And, you know, the, you know, fossils are such that not everything preserves. So we may not be getting a full picture of what was going on back then, but they do give us a pretty good picture as it turns out. So they have this table, developmental characters for representative taxa and the genetic controls. So they're looking at these uh, phenotypic uh, traits and then they're looking at the regulatory mechanisms here and then they're, you know, assembling this comparison. And um, so that's it for that paper. Uh, then finally, there's this paper on baby tyrannosaurid bones and teeth from the late Cretaceous of Western North America. So this paper is interesting because it shows sort of the development of teeth and bones associated with tooth development in dinosaurs. And so they show embryonic, uh, an embryonic dentary uh, measuring just three centimeters long already exhibits distinctive tyrannosaurid character, characters like a chin and deep Mechlean groove. I mean, these are, again, these are things that they use to describe the samples that they're uh, getting and, and classifying. Reveals the earliest stages of tooth development. And so th they kind of discuss like some aspects of like tooth development in a dinosaur and like, you know, evaluated. This is very, 
much hardcore paleontology in this paper, so I don't know how much you might get out of it. I'm not really seeing a lot to highlight in it um, for a general audience, but it's definitely like, you know, intriguing to see how you have this, basically have this developmental model from millions of years ago. So you can see a picture of the teeth here um, and what they look like, you know, the precursors to teeth. So this is all very good stuff. So, I mean, this is all food for thought. I, I would like to maybe explore this a bit more, but I think it's fascinating stuff. Um, one final paper I'm going to talk about today. Actually, I might, well, I think I can talk about this one. Circumventing neural damage in a C. elegans chemosensory circuit using genetically engineered synapses. This is a relatively new paper. Um, so this, uh, these cell papers often give like a graphic at the beginning, a graphical abstract. And so this basically summarizes the paper. So you have this, this is an adult C. elegans. This is the head, this is the tail, and here's an odorant. So this is a, a stimulus that the head is moving towards. And this is, uh, you know, this is uh, responsible for this is this chemosensory circuit, which is part of the nervous system. So the worm has sensory neurons in the head that pick up this odor and can track the odor and move towards it. So the circuit is formed in development and then persists across the adult phenotype. And if you can, you can create mutants that have defects in this circuit. So cells cannot uh, grow up in development and affect the uh, formation of the adult circuit or you can have connections that don't form. So there are other, you know, there are a number of ways that this chemotaxis circuit can be perturbed or, you know, um, made not to work. Uh, and so that's what they show here is that this chemos chemosensory circuit is actually, in this case, um, suffered some neuronal damage. But it can also be that there are some mutants of C. elegans where this is damaged uh, through a genetic ablation or a genetic knockout of some gene. So in this case, the basically the short of it is, is that this chemosensory circuit is un uncoupled or unwired. And so now the worm doesn't recognize the odor at all. And this is bad for the worm if, if the odor is the signal they need to find food. Um, and they don't have vision uh, they have some other, they have mechanosensation and they have chemosensation. So if they don't have good chemosensation, they're probably in a lot of trouble. And then finally, in this paper, what they do is they knock out part of the circuit. And then they, inter they have a genetically inserted synapse that they can put in. They can control, they put in a genetic element into the worm, and they can control where these synapses form. And so what they can do is they can knock out part of the circuit and then regenerate the circuit by putting this genetic insertion in. So by doing this two-step process, by knocking out part of the circuit, and then by knocking in a repair or, or a workaround, then the, they can demonstrate that the worm will now be attracted to the odor. So this is pretty nice. This is a pretty nice paper. Uh, it's, it's hardcore, you know, uh, uh, genetic... Uh, manipulation, genetic engineering, but you know if you follow through, you follow this basic logic that you know neuron loss disrupts chemosensation. You can insert a synapse, an electrical synapse, to circumvent the damage. You can find alternate pathways for information flow, so these circuits aren't hardwired to a specific connectivity pattern. There are alternate pathways that you can use, and a weakened signal can be enhanced due to a new lateral left right electrical coupling. So in doing this regeneration of, of connections between cells in the circuit, you can actually find maybe things that are almost as good as the original connection, but you know maybe something that was lost in evolution or never happened. Uh, wow. So this is very very interesting paper. Um, they kind of go through the circuit here the sort of, you know, there's a, a, there are chemical synapses and electrical synapses. The electrical synapses are where the cells are in contact and there's a gap junction where you have electrical, it's a sort of a fast signaling. And then the chemical synapse is your typical thing you think of when you think of like an axon and, and synapses 
communicating with one another with neurotransmitters. Um, so you have those two types of connectivity. And the C. elegans connectome, of course, as we know, you we've defined every cell, and every cell is, you know, has a defined role uh, from development. So we know like how to manipulate this thing pretty well as a consequence. And so that's what they do in this paper. They manipulate it. They um, they show the gap junction here. They show some of the evidence here for what they're doing. They're able to verify these things. If you don't know much about how they do these knockouts and knock-ins, they use a fluorescent element to uh, find like different things that are expressed. And they can tell whether some gene is being expressed in a neuron. These green blotches here show like different cells where a gene is expressed. And if they knock it out, then they can look under a microscope and see that that green blob is no longer there. If they knock in a new element and they want to see if that gene is being expressed, then they can look under the microscope and see that the green blob reappears there where they've knocked it back in. And so all those things, you know, though those are that's the way they sort of verify this stuff. So they know that that's what's responsible for this. And so this, again, is another example of the connectome with the cells and the connections, chemical and electrical. And then they have these synthetic electrical synapses. So they form these gap junctions between cells artificially. They knock in a, an element. They can verify it with these green blobs. And then now they should observe res restored function in this circuit. And so that's exactly what they observe. And this is an example here of uh, sort of an, a figure six or a figure seven. This is a famous thing in biology papers where they show like the, the higher level concept they're trying to communicate in this figure. And so in figure six, they have distributed information flow in the C. elegans olfactory circuit. They show sensory neurons, inner neurons, and then going down to motor neurons. And they show so neural information flow is often described as a progressing from sensory neurons to interneurons to motor neurons. So this is the typical view. Our study highlights the importance of a more distributed flow of information between interneurons, so between these cells, and within neurons. So within sensory neurons, even, there's communication. So it's not a hierarchical system from sensory neuron to motor neuron, as a lot of people like to characterize it as a feed forward network but it also you have a lot of communication between cells and so by knocking in these alternate uh, gap junctions you can actually observe these types of connections between cells at these different levels and so a feed forward a simple feed forward network becomes this really complex thing so that's uh, that's a good paper if you're interested in uh, this sort of work um, it's very informative if you're interested in the C. elegans connectome because they're actually manipulating it. So I think the final paper I want to get into here um, today is, um, I don't want to say, this one I'll pick. Uh, retinal waves, but not visual experience, are required for development of retinal direction selectivity maps. Um, this is a paper on retinal developments. So this isn't C. elegans, but uh, this is about development of the nervous system. And they say retinal waves and visual experience have been implicated in the formation of retinotopic and eye specific maps throughout the visual system. So, as you might know, in, in humans and in, in mammals and in that type of nervous system, you have this retinotopic map that forms. And it forms generally through experience. Um, so the organism has to see things and it maps things in space to different parts of the retina and there's this map, this representation that forms that gives it a lot of, you know, the information that needs to be maintain its wiring pattern. Uh, but they also talk about retinal waves here. So they don't know which one plays a role in the development of the maps within the retina. So which one actually, you think like visual experience forms these maps. But then, of course, they want to know if that's actually true. So we explore this question using direction-selective retinal ganglion cells, which are organized into a map that aligns to the body and gravitational axis of optic flow. So it's aligned to the, the, where the body is going in space, 
and some of the uh, axes of what's being experienced. So when you move around a room, you see things come up on you. You know, you see like the wall kind of loom in front of you bigger and bigger as you walk towards it and you walk away, it becomes smaller and smaller. All that information is called optic flow. And this is one of the things they're using in this experiment. So they use this two photon calcium imaging technology and they find that direction selectivity maps are present at eye opening and is unaltered by dark rearing. This is when they put like their subject, it, it's some sort of animal model in a dark room constantly. So that means that they can't see things as well uh, as they would in, in a lighted room. And so remarkably, the horizontal component of the direction selectivity map is absent in mice, lacking normal retinal waves, whereas the vertical component remains normal. These results indicate that intrinsic patterns of activity rather than extrinsic motion signals are critical for the establishment of direction selectivity maps in the retina. So this means that what they call intrinsic patterns of activity rather than these motion cues from the environment are critical for the establishment of these selectivity maps. So they kind of go into the, the details of this, um, you know, how this happens. They do these experiments in light and dark. And basically, you know, people think that, you know, uh, experience dependent plasticity is where you see things in the environment and you learn from what you're exposed to. So if you're exposed to a sparse environment, you don't get as much of that experience. If you are exposed in a rich environment or a lighted environment, you get more things that you interact with and you, you can detect visually. And so what they're saying is that's not really the only aspect to this. There's another aspect, which are these um, retinal waves. And so I'm trying to find an example of what they mean by retinal wave exactly. but. Um, they show that there's some results that occur in mice that you don't necessarily see in a model like a ferret, which is another model organism that they use for this sort of thing. These findings indicate direction selectivity maps are well established at eye opening, independent of visual experience. So these maps are actually formed not just by just pure experience, but there's an underlying biological sort of process that goes on to form them. And so this is all, you know, these papers are usually not like terribly synthetic in terms of like what the findings are and, you know, placing in the larger context, but it definitely has a lot of detail on some of the things that they've found in their experiment and how it's relevant to things in the literature. So I think this is a really good paper for like, you know, if, I know Jesse is interested in this and if you're interested in biologically inspired AI, this is interesting. There are other papers that have come out recently on other types of things using neural networks to model some of these processes. So we'll talk about those maybe next week. Um, so I don't think there are any good pictures in here. No, but I, I can share these papers with people if they're interested. So I, I guess we've lost a lot of people here, but um, thanks for those of you who stuck out the meeting. Um, and if you're you know, next week we'll probably have maybe some presentations on some of the ongoing GSOC projects and other things. Um, otherwise, I let's see, we have a lot of things in the chat I can go through before we go. Um, yeah, so we had people out of leave, um, paper references in Zotero. So Jesse put some of these in Zotero. Thank you. Krishna had to leave. Susan had to leave, actually. No, she's not quite left yet, but... Um, and then, yeah, so people will leave, basically. Okay. Um, but, yeah, so do we have any questions before we go? Uh, I have one question, Bradley. Okay. Uh, so, uh, suppose I'm interested in studying uh, behavior of silicates, right? Yes. Uh, right. So, for example... Um, there is a simple environment and there are several food uh, spots and um, we would like to predict where the sea elegant would go, which food source it will go to first or there are some obstacles and uh, how it will behave uh, depending on different kind of obstacles. Like have you, uh, have you either you or uh, open worm 
has done any work related to that, like modeling really simple environments and then uh, trying to um, try to do some uh, machine learning agents compare to the real uh, worms, how, how they compare with each other. Uh, I think that uh, some of the people doing the movement work, so like the movement uh, validation group, they've, I don't know about obstacles, but they've definitely looked at like movement and C. elegans. So C. elegans has very stereotypical movements. Sometimes they do movements to back away from a food source or to move for, towards a food source. You know, and they do other types of movements like that. So they have a lot of that characterized in, in, in that movement database that I showed earlier. Uh, I also know that the Geppetto people are also interested in doing work on um, different, um, you know, different types of like simulating behavior. C302, of course, is, uh, they do this stuff with like simulating the, the connectome. But I think like there's some somewhat of an interest in using machine learning to sort of validate some of these behaviors. But I don't know if anyone's working on that very thing. So I don't know if you might you might get in touch with some of the people in Geppetto and some of those other uh, groups as well to see what they're up to, what the latest what they're up to. I don't really know what they're the latest thing that they're doing, but yeah, I would say, uh, uh, I, uh, for example, I would not maybe I'm not interested in like detailed uh, movement of the C elements, but I'm more interested in high level if you can call it uh, cognition abilities uh, or how do they uh, uh, choose one mate or another or how do they uh, prefer one food source or if you get an idea of what I mean. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Yeah, it, I don't know if we're doing anything like that currently. But um, actually, Tom Portagees might be someone to talk to. He, he sometimes attends this group and he's doing some work on with agents um he does he works in the robots channel sometimes too and he's doing a lot of work with agents and simulating behavior and things like that so he might actually be a good person to talk to i don't know about like uh you know i don't know what he's doing in c elegans right now but like he's definitely interested in those topics yeah and also this uh multi-agent reinforcement learning is kind of hot topic right now and it would be interesting to see if there are some opportunities here uh, so how does tom how, how is the last name can you type it in, in the chat yeah let me type it in here yeah this is all interesting stuff for me too i'm going to do a little bit of overlap to like the brain of people stuff but um you know i think multi-agent Organization topic in general. Yeah. Yeah, my other group were kind of interested in this stuff too. So the other group that we have, and you can contact Jesse uh, Parent to get in the loop on this, but we do this, uh, we, we have, we've been working on sort of topics like this, like reinforcement learning and other things that are maybe more interesting, you know, in terms of the higher level behaviors. So that might be an interesting conversation to have. Oh, as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Okay, so uh, if you don't have any other comments or questions, uh, everyone have a good week. Um, I'll meet next week or be in touch via Slack. So. Okay, here. Thank you.